For the last uh, few weeks, we've been in a study working our way through the book of Haggai. Um, And we're going to finish that study today, and I hope that this time that we've been having together has really been a redemptive time for you, that it's been a good study through this book, a book that you probably previously just breezed right through, because if you don't know where Haggai is, I I don't blame you. It is one page in my Bible. This, This is the entirety of this Old Testament prophet's book. It's not a book that you spend a whole lot of time in, but there's some great lessons for us today. The same God who was the God 2,600 years ago is the same God today. The same problems that they had 2,600 years ago are are many of the same problems that we have today. And, And as we see the hand of God working through these people, I think we see a lot of similarities oftentimes that apply to our lives here today. So I'm going to do a brief recap if you're visiting, and then we'll jump in uh, where we will left off last week and finish up this book. So the back story on the book of Haggai is it's 586 B.C. And the nation of Israel, if you know your Old Testament, has all these peaks and valleys. And it's a lot of valleys and just a few peaks, frankly. But they, they frequently lose their focus of following God, fall into idolatry, and then God uses somebody or something to get their attention. He basically takes a two-by-four upside their heads, knocks a little sense into them, gets their attention, and says, come back to me, and, and finally, eventually, they do. And that's kind of where we find ourselves in the book of Haggai. They had fallen into idolatry, and God had warned them. God, God said to them, if you forsake me and run after idols, I'm going to allow you to be enslaved. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. The Babylonians come in, they ransack uh, the city of Jerusalem, they decimate the temple of Solomon. They destroy it. They knock every single brick off of every other brick, just absolutely destroy the temple. And then they enslave all of the Israelites. Uh, They take those Israelites about 900 miles away in captivity. Um, So these Babylonians are, are the 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 hand of the wrath of God, so to speak, here. And in captivity for the next 50 years would live the Israelites away from Jerusalem. Well, what happens in the story next is the Persians come along and they're bigger and badder and meaner and stronger than the Babylonians, so they knock them off. But the good news is the Persians are a little bit more accepting of other viewpoints in religion. And so they look at the Israelites and go, you know what? You don't need to stay here anymore. You've been here for 50 years. Go home. And, and, and literally, they, they free the Israelites. And so, um, give or take, 50,000 Israelites return back to their homeland in Jerusalem. Now, not all go. Some remain behind. And we will study that this fall. Don't get too far ahead of me. We'll get to the book of Esther eventually. But uh, some do remain. But 50,000 Jews take this offer. They go back home. And, and their command is to do three things. Go back and build the temple. Go back, rebuild the city. And go back and rebuild the people of God. And their first order of business was to build the temple of God. So they get back to Jerusalem, and they they begin rebuilding, and no sooner than they begin this rebuilding process on the temple, this used to be Solomon's temple, they they begin rebuilding this temple, um, and and then persecution comes. Persecution comes from a group called the Samaritans. You've probably heard of them before. And they start persecuting the Israelites. And the Israelites kind of chicken out, and they say, man, it's kind of hard to do this work with these people pestering us, Right? So I think God is just telling us, let's go, let's go work on our own houses. I mean, that, that's what they do. And for the next 15 years, instead of working on the, on, the, on, the, on the temple that they were told to build, they go and they build nice fancy houses. They build nice lives for themselves. They go and focus on me, 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 right? And nothing gets done on the temple at all. And so... If you were walking in, you'd see the city of Jerusalem, and you'd see some pretty swanky houses. And and the Bible tells us they paneled these houses, right? And and there's not a lot of trees in Jerusalem. So they were traveling to other places to get wood, to haul it back, to make these fancy. I mean, they were putting some work into these houses. And you show up, and there's a mansion here, and there's a swanky house there. And right in the middle of town is this giant pile of rubble that should be where everybody worships. Eh, what's, what's up with this mess, right? Something is just not right. So what God does is God sends Haggai to come and challenge the people. And, and he basically says, says to Haggai, or Haggai says to them, listen guys, God didn't redeem us from captivity so that we would come back here and focus on our own lives. 
He didn't set us free, so we would spend 15 years working for us. So we need to turn this around. God has saved you so that you would be a part of His work, not your work. He has saved you so that you would go and rebuild the temple to the glory of God so that His name would be magnified among all of the nations. So get back to work is what Haggai says. God is for this and in this. He has big plans for this. So quit paying attention to your own lives and get focused on building God's kingdom. And sure enough, when Haggai comes and he shares this message with them, uh, the, the Spirit begins to stir in their hearts and, and they, they repent of focusing on themselves and they get their hands to work finally. And they get going and get back to building the temple. And, and now they're back to building the temple with some excitement. And this brings us to our second sermon in this series. And so they're working on this and they've been excited. But then, all of a sudden, discouragement creeps in. You see, when these 50,000 people came back from Babylonian captivity, they come back, some of them had lived in Jerusalem at the time when Solomon's temple was still there. If you don't know about Solomon's temple, one of the most opulent buildings in the history of mankind, an amazing building, one of the wonders of the world, just fantastic beyond description. And so these people had seen this place. This was the place to be. And now they're back and they're building this temple. And you've got these folks who are looking at it going, I don't know about that. It doesn't really look like Solomon's temple. Well, in the meantime, you have all these younger folks who, who grew up in Babylonian captivity. <coughs> Excuse me. They, they'd never seen Solomon's temple. And, and they're building it. And they're going, look, we're doing something. We're doing God's work. This is awesome, right? And so they're excited. But these other folks are going, well, yeah, you're putting something up. But it looks like a shack. I mean, that doesn't, shoo. I don't think God's going to want to live there. It's kind of ugly, right? I mean, it's just not Solomon's temple. Well, as happens with discouragement, discouragement kind of seeps, right? And it oozes. And it begins to get infectious. And so the people who were excited are kind of going, oh, you don't like this? And, and they kind of get discouraged too. And pretty soon, everybody is discouraged. So God sends Haggai in a second time. And Haggai comes in and, and uh, tries to get them back on track and says, Hey, listen here, look here. You're building this by sight. But God has something bigger in store for this temple than you can see. God is in this and is going to do a great work. You can't envision it yet. Yeah, sure, it does not look like Solomon's temple. Don't worry about that. God is going to use this in ways that are so unimaginably amazing and big, it would blow your mind if you understood. You can't even fathom it. Get to work. He's going to use us. Quit operating by sight. Operate by faith. Hold fast to the promises of God. The God who promises you. The God who... We're going to study in a little bit here about the Exodus and the God who set us free. And then He's going to do amazing things with us. See, this temple that they are rebuilding, if you don't know the, the history of the Bible, this is the temple where Jesus would go and worship. This is the temple where Jesus' parents brought Him there. This is the temple where, as I mentioned, uh, Jesus' parents forgot him at the temple for a couple of days and lost the Son of God, right? Um, they're walking along on the dirt road back home, and all of a sudden, Joseph's like, Hey, have you seen Jesus, Mary? No. How, have you seen Jesus, Joseph? Not for a couple of days. Trouble. Uh, but they go back and find Jesus there studying and learning. This is the same temple Jesus is going to go through. He's going to turn over tables. He's going to grab a whip. He's going to get angry at the money changers in this very temple. And then long term, uh, beyond the physical temple, this is the, the temple, the kingdom that God is building through Jesus. The Jesus as the Messiah. That Jesus is going to come and establish His authority on earth forever. And so that's kind of the vision Haggai casts for them. And again, the, the Spirit begins to stir up in the people, and they finally get back to work. Now you'd think, okay, now they got the idea. We're building the temple, right? Off we go. But three weeks later, right? This is the story of the Israelites. Just, it's like a roller coaster. 
Three weeks later, God has to send Haggai a third time because somehow in the process of building this temple, of actually finally being on mission, the people have become convinced that because they were engaged in this religious activity of of building the temple, that somehow the actions of their work made them holy in God's eyes. And then through that, somehow then, because they are doing this for God, then God must be obligated to bless them, right? But that's not really how it works. Just because you do something with your hands, just because you touch something in in a religious activity, just because you engage your hands in works, it doesn't make you holy. It doesn't work that way. In fact, the Bible even tells us and goes so far as to say that we are unclean. That we are sinners, right? And that anything we touch isn't made holy. In fact, it's the very opposite. The things we touch as broken sinners, if we touch it, we make it a mess. That's the way things work in this world, unfortunately. And so what you and I and the world and the people of this time were in need of was a heart transformation. We need that cleansing from the inside out. So that our our holy, our religious activity, that doesn't make us holy before God. What does make us holy before God is His grace. We sang about that just a little minute ago. Grace alone, which God supplies. Uh, I don't supply the grace. I'm a recipient. And so what God wants uh, beyond our participation is, is, as David says in Psalm 51, He wants us to have this broken and contrite heart. That's what God's after. That's the kind of heart God can use. That heart that's been changed and been transformed. And from that day forward, instead of working for myself, I'm working for God. Not because I can earn it, but because of the grace that He has poured out on us. And that's where we left off last week. So now we have remaining in the book of Haggai, if you're following along, four more verses to cover. And there's one last message that comes to us that's going to take place over these last four verses in Haggai 2. And and that fourth message, uh, you're welcome to follow along in your Bibles. We'll throw some of it on the screen. There's Bibles in the seat in front of you, and there's also Bibles on the Welcome Center if you need one, or you could use you version on your phone. Uh, But but as you get into that, we're in Haggai 2, and in the very last four verses of it, um, we're going to see that Haggai is sent in for a fourth time here. But we get a unique message this time. The first three messages, he came and he spoke to the people of God all three times. On this fourth message, Haggai is going to speak to one person rather than all of the 50,000 who had returned uh, to Jerusalem. And so it's a little bit different. And, And these words are just for one man. And it starts in verse 20, if you want to follow along. It says, The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. So this is the same day as last week. And he says, Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. So this this message is specifically for Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel is this governor of of Judah. Uh, He was a political leader who was going to take the people back and help them jumpstart this rebuilding process of the city and the temple. And and many, as I've studied this, uh, many people feel that as these 15 years have transpired of of Israel being back and, and in this rebuilding process, that of the people who were there working, nobody was more discouraged than Zerubbabel. This whole process was a whole process. Even though he was the key leader, he, of all the people, was probably the most discouraged person. Um, We see first in that very first sermon we talked about, Zerubbabel was part of a greater promise that had occurred 500 years before this. 500 years earlier, God met with King David, and he made a promise. We call it the Davidic promise. This promise was that through David's line, there would be many kings that would come in the days ahead. And eventually through that line would come a king who would establish a throne forever. There would be this messianic king who would come and deliver the people from their sins. He would erect his throne and have dominion over all of the earth and would put down all of their authority and all of their powers. So that king was, was yet to come. And, and Jesus, of course, is the prophetic fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. And in the genealogy of Jesus, if you read through the book of Matthew, there you'll find Zerubbabel, right? 
Zerubbabel was part of this Davidic covenant. He was supposed to be the king over Israel. And it's through that very line that, that ten generations after Zerubbabel, Jesus would come. And so Jesus is to be the fulfillment of all of this. But what discouraged Zerubbabel so much when the reason why he was probably the most depressed guy in the whole town was be, he probably believed at this point that this was a promise that was never going to come true. Because in 586, as I mentioned, the, the Babylonians had come when Zerubbabel was just a tiny little boy, taken them into captivity. This was when his, his grandfather Jehoiakim was the king of Judah at that time. And so when the Babylonians come in and they drive out the Israelites, they take Jehoiakim, who's the king, they lock him up for about 36 years in prison. And so Zerubbabel's looking and going, my, my family line is over. I'm, I'm not king. I'm a governor, but I'm not the king of Israel. I'm not the ruler. First it was the Babylonians, and now it's the Persians. I'm not going to be king. I'm not going to get to fulfill my destiny. What, what am I doing here? You know? I mean, that's... My father was king. My grandfather was king. His father was king. They were kings all, you know, for, for generations before. Now, I've screwed up. and I've kind of ruined that line. And he was worried that his destiny was to be ruled by a foreign nation and never to be the king. So he's got to be feeling like, where's the hope? Yeah, I'm involved in the work of the church, but man, I just don't feel the hope. Where's the promise in this? What's to become of me? And in this case, what's to become of him if he isn't going to be king? So what God does is he sends in Haggai to give this final message. A message of hope to someone who is incredibly discouraged. Now, of the four different messages in this book, the first and the third messages are rebukes. Haggai comes in in the first and third and rebukes the people because they were not doing what they're supposed to do. The second and the fourth messages, however, are encouragements. And so this book is, is going to end by kind of lifting up the eyes of Zerubbabel, by, by lifting, hopefully, his spirits a little bit. And in fact, Haggai is going to come in and he's going to go, Zerubbabel, let me take you to a place that you just can't see right now, okay? Let me take you to an event down the road where you and your line are going to be used in amazing and mighty ways. Let me show you just a, a little bit the tremendous significance of what it is that we are doing right now. So look at verse 21. It says, Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. This is the same message that was given way back in verse 7 of Haggai 2 to the entire nation. And it says, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. And I am about to overthrow the thrones of kingdoms. And I am about to destroy the strength of kingdoms of the nations and overthrow their chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down and every one by the sword of his brother. So here comes this prophecy again that we saw two weeks ago about this futuristic event, this cataclysmic event, this apocalyptic event that, that there's going to be this just massive battle with these armies of the earth all coming together. And in a moment it says God is going to destroy all of them. He's going to purge the nations and all these foreign nations are going to go down. And, and in that then He's going to set up His kingdom. right? And, and, and this kingdom is going to endure forever. Now when you're reading Scripture and you're hearing about the Bible and you hear of a battle like that where all of the nations are going to be defeated, you go, well, yeah, I think I maybe have heard of that before. What battle are we talking about here biblically? Well, Armageddon, right? This is the book of Revelation. If you've read the book of Revelation, this is, you know, we get to that. And Armageddon would be the closest thing that we have that would talk about this very thing. If you're following along and you want to know a little bit more, flip over to Hebrews 12 for a minute. And I want to show you just a, a, a snapshot of the description uh, of what this kind of apocalyptic event looks like. Starting in verse 25 of Hebrews 12, the author of Hebrews is, is giving a, a warning, an admonition to the believers in Christ, and he's encouraging them uh, to, to not give up, to persevere. Because the Lord was about to do something amazing. So in Hebrews 12, 25, it says, See that you do not refuse Him who is speaking. Now that Him there is God. Don't refuse God. 
As God is laying before you, there is this time coming in which all the nations will be put down by the sword and God will establish His throne. See to it that you don't reject that. See to it that you don't refuse what God is promising to do. What God is promising will happen on that day. And what does he do at the end of verse 25 is he's going to use, as I said, this uh, example of the exodus of of the Egyptians and how how the Egyptians kind of turned their nose up at God and, and as a result were judged for it. There he says, For if the Egyptians did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, remember the story, Moses comes in. and Moses had originally lived with the king had gone into exile after he killed a man, comes back, comes back and God has tasked him with his job of going before Pharaoh and saying, hey Pharaoh, um, you know, you need to let God's people go. Well, you see, that was a problem in Egypt because the entire economy was built on the back of these Jewish slaves. And if you're Pharaoh and you're going, you've lost your mind, I'm not setting free like a million, two million people, that's going to destroy my economy. We're we're never going to get anything done without you guys. No. So Pharaoh, of course, the Bible tells us, had a hard heart. Moses keeps coming back and going, if you don't let us go, bad things are going to happen, right? And through this series of bad things, these plagues and all these other things, one after the other getting worse and worse, to the final point at which Moses says, hey, if you don't let us go, All the firstborn males are going to die in every household. And only those, he doesn't tell Pharaoh this, but only those who had the blood of the lamb over the doorpost would the angel of the Lord pass by. And so this comes to be true, and Pharaoh's own son dies. And it finally brings Pharaoh to his breaking point, where he says, all right, get out of here. Go. Be gone. I can't stand near you. I just go leave. But so they do. The Jews pack up, grab all their stuff, and get out of town as quick as they can, right? But if you know the story of the Exodus, all of a sudden Pharaoh goes, hold on a second. That wasn't such a good idea. Hey army, go get them. I don't want to set them free. So he changes his mind. And the judgment eventually comes then as uh, they get to the edge of the Red Sea and Everybody's looking around. There's an army coming. There's a sea in front of us. What are we going to do? Well, God performs a miracle and splits that body of water. The Israelites walk across on dry ground. Well, that army's job is to go get them, so it chases after them. And you know what happens then, right? Whoosh! God hits the flush button and wipes out the entire Egyptian army. All like that. And so, in Hebrews here, The author is saying, don't turn your nose up to God, just like those Egyptians did. What what we're telling you here is not a joke. God is coming back. God is going to, to wage a war. God is serious about this. Don't turn your nose up to God. He will come and establish His throne again forever. And then in verse 26 it says, at that time... His voice shook the earth, but now He has promised, yet one more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. See, the the author of Hebrews is is quoting from the Old Testament here. And if you're wondering what all this means, he, He interprets it for you in verse 27. It says, this phrase, once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, the things that have been made, the order of things, cannot be shaken and cannot, may not any longer remain. And so he's saying back in the days of Egypt, those things that they thought were impenetrable, those things that they thought couldn't be shaken, Egypt kind of had you know, a chip on their shoulder and thought they were the best thing going, right? God in a moment changed all of that. And just as he did that, God will, through his Messiah, set up dominion on the earth. 
So even in Hebrews, this, this New Testament author is quoting this Old Testament and, and, and talking about this day that is to come, this day that Haggai comes to Zerubbabel to talk about. We'll see more of it if you want to study it. Go look and read Revelation 16. I figured you wanted to get out of here before 1 o'clock, so I didn't include that in my sermon. But Re- Revelation 16, if you want to know more about this. And I want to be abundantly clear. God is coming back through Jesus Christ. Jesus wins. And so Haggai comes along. And he points us to this event in the future where the Messiah will come, where he's going to defeat all the nations in one, one, one sweeping battle, and it's all going to be done. And then the world will never know another kingdom. It will be God's kingdom. And so he shares this with Zerubbabel. Now can you imagine Zerubbabel, who'd been like the most depressed guy in town, all of a sudden hearing that, you know, this temple we're doing, this work that we're doing, is going to result in something amazing someday. He's got to be going, yeah, that sounds, sounds pretty good to me, right? That sounds pretty amazing. But I'm glad God's going to do that. But what does it have to do with me? I mean, here I am. I'm this governor of this backwaters area. What does it have to do with me? And the last verse in the whole book of Haggai says this. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, and declares the Lord, and makes, I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Now this becomes interesting here, because basically God says, here's how this is going to play out. This event that I'm talking to you about, this Armageddon, this, this final battle, all of that stuff is going to happen, I'm going to use you in that event, Zerubbabel. I'm going to use you. You who thinks there's nothing left for you, you who, who have lost hope, you who thinks there's no promise yet to be fulfilled for you in your life. No, there is. When I shake the earth, when all of the heavens shake, when the Messiah comes and sets up shops at Rubabel, on that day, I'm going to use you in a powerful way. Well then, the question is, has that happened yet, right? And I think most of us would agree it has not. We haven't seen a time between 520 B.C. and 2018 where all the nations were overthrown, have we? No. So this battle hasn't happened yet. So, so how is God going to use Zerubbabel? Is he literally going to use the physical Zerubbabel? I mean, is he like walking around like some 2,600-year-old zombie today? Well, No. That's not what the Bible is saying. I mean, we believe Zerubbabel is dead. Ezra, Ezra records uh, an interesting, you know, I've talked about how these books overlap. You've got Ezra, and you've, you've got uh, Haggai, and you've got Esther, and um, we've got these Old Testament prophet books that all overlap and tell the same timeline from different perspectives. And Ezra, in his book, he records a list of people who were at the temple when the temple was rededicated. You see, the Israelites, once they got back to work here, finally did complete rebuilding the temple. And Ezra made a list of, here's the people who were there that day. You know who is not on that list? Zerubbabel. It's believed that Zerubbabel lived until the temple was completed, died before they could consecrate it. He didn't get to see it opened for business, so to speak. So how is he going to be used? Well, I think the answer is there in verse 23. It says, I'm going to use you like a signet ring. Okay? Well, what is a signet ring? If you've you watched, you know, shows with kings and queens and things of the olden days, you know, they take that wax, they write out something important, they take that wax from the candle, drip it on the paper, and press the ring into it and seal it shut. And if you got that piece of paper and that, that wax wasn't broken yet, you knew nobody had kind of cheated and opened it and read your mail, right? That it was secure. So kings and monarchs and rulers, uh, they wear these rings, or maybe sometimes they wear them around their necks or whatever. They use it to press in the wax, and it would be an official sign of the authority of the king. And so, God says, Zerubbabel, I'm going to use you, as one would use a signet ring. (coughs) That the line of David isn't complete. It isn't done. It's not over for you. Now here's why Zerubbabel was probably discouraged. In Jeremiah 22, a curse was made on Zerubbabel's grandfather because of his sinfulness, because of his wickedness. 
Jeremiah 22, 24 says, As I live, declares the Lord, though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, the, son, the king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, yet if you were, I would tear you off and give you into the hands of those who seek your life, into the, the hand of those whom you are afraid of, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. So this curse is given to Zerubbabel's grandfather because God is basically saying, I am so sick of you guys, of your wickedness, of your sinfulness. You're done, buddy. Your reign is over. God says to his grandfather, if you were my signet ring, I'd rip you off my finger and throw you to the dogs. And God then lets the Babylonians come in and capture the people at that time. So it's Rubabel, that's as I said, is thinking, will my line continue? And in the midst of that deep discouragement, that he had really nothing left to live for, Haggai comes along with this beautiful message from God. And he says, listen, you might not see the work that God is doing right now. And I want you to hear this yourselves today too. Sometimes when we are working in a church, we're working hard. You're working with that challenging child on Wednesday night, right? And that kid just doesn't ever seem to listen and learn, right? I used to be that kid, by the way. I'm dead serious. There was 18 years of my life, 19 years of my life, where oh, every Sunday school teacher was like, praise the Lord, he's not in my class next year. <laughs> I can give you their numbers and you can call and verify. We work hard at things, right? We keep praying for that child of ours who just has gone this other way. We, we keep talking to this neighbor, but boy, that guy is really irritating, right? We keep doing what we think God wants us to do. We keep, we, we're working on this kingdom work, but it feels like I'm just spinning my tires, like I'm not going anywhere, like, I'm not, like, like nothing is getting done. And that, that's where Zerubbabel was. He's like, oh, I, I, we're doing this work, but what's the point? Where are we going? And Haggai comes in and he says, Take courage. Your labor is not in vain. Right now, you're building into something bigger and better than you can see. And with that, the book of Haggai ends. So what do we take away from this book? I mean, we've been given four messages. They come over this six-month period in the nation of Israel. What do we do with all of this, right? Well, first, we need to see that God redeemed them from captivity. They were slaves. They could have been under Babylon forever, but God redeemed them. And not only redeemed them, but ransomed them. He, he bought them and brought them out. and He delivered them and brought them salvation. And they came back to Him. Hey, that sounds like my story, right? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but, but now I can see. And God comes along and says, listen, I didn't save you to focus on yourselves, right? We learned this in the first week. We're working on something bigger here. And then discouragement kind of creeps in. And people are looking in the rear view mirror going, what used to happen was better than what I'm seeing ahead of us. And God says, no, I need you to be a forward-thinking people. Move forward, not based on sight, but based on the promises that I have put before you. And then finally, God is, or thirdly, God is saying to us, as you move forward into this mission... Understand that it's not the work that you were doing that makes you holy. It's the heart from within that must be cleansed by God Himself. And then that work matters. And then the final point, as we learn today, is that God is not done with this kingly line. God is not done with us yet. God is not done with His story yet. There is one who is going to come again to reign and rule over all. And that is Jesus Christ. That is a beautiful thing. That that day is coming and we have it looked forward. We have it to look forward to. That God is not done. He is still working. He is still liberating. He is still changing. He is still transforming. Even if occasionally we're not seeing it. 
So we have to have our hearts right and our affections right. Our focus needs to be on God and building His kingdom and not our kingdom. Working for Him. Storing up treasures for, in heaven, not, not in our 401ks. 401ks aren't bad, but that's not where we need to primarily store our treasure. Because the end is coming. His kingdom will be rebuilt. And that's why if you're a believer sitting here today, sitting in this room today, God has a work for you to do. If you are still breathing, God has a plan for you. He has a work that He wants you to be involved in. It's not by mistake that you woke up today and that your eyes opened and that you took a breath. God has work for you. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 5, he says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, Paul is saying, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, don't act like a fool walking around like the rest of your days don't matter. God has a plan for you. Get to work. And if that is true, and it is, I believe it truly is, then that thinking should saturate your decision making every day of your life. Because it reframes everything. It reframes how I'm going to live with my family, how I'm going to spend my time and my money, and the decisions that I make, the investments that I'm going to make. Having a kingdom priority. Understanding that we are in a mission, on mission, doing God's work. So if you ever come to the point where you feel like, what's the point of all of this? Why are we in this? Why are we doing this? Where is this going? Don't be discouraged. No, God is in it. God is for it. And God can and will work through you. Continue on working until either God calls you home or that Armageddon happens. And either way, then someday we will all be sitting before the throne of Jesus singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy is our Lord God Almighty. That is what we work towards. Amen? That's Haggai. Thanks for being part of it. Let's pray.